think it should work. All right, well, I'm, I'm glad that so many of you could make it here. Um, before I start my talk, I just, one of the aims of putting this conference together was to try and get a narrative going and move It's going to work, yeah. All right. Okay. All right. We'll try and continue. So uh, one of the aims was to try and coordinate the talks somehow so that. Um, you know, you wouldn't get these completely disconnected things. Now, unfortunately, we didn't quite achieve that to the extent that we, we wanted to, but I did correspond with Monica quite a bit, and we had quite a bit of to and fro. So, you know, to, to try and reduce the level of confusion, because we tend to use different terms and focus on different things, I, I would like to just comment now, and we can certainly pick that up, you know, in the panels we want to try and integrate ideas a little, little bit more and get, get things together and try and tease out what are, are the key different, uh, differences and where do we agree. I'd like to say that uh, I, I agree uh, uh, with most of what Monica is saying. However, there are some key differences, and I'm saying this so that maybe what I'm talking about may make a little bit more sense or hopefully won't confuse you more. So the, the one thing that I, I really have a great difficulty with is in saying that understanding is all subconscious uh, and that language is understanding is, uh, doesn't require reasoning. Now, Monica just spent 35 minutes talking to you. If language understanding was subconscious, then basically you would have absorbed and understood everything she said unconsciously, uh, which you clearly didn't. You clearly had to think, well, hopefully some of you were thinking about what she was saying. So to understand language, to understand, to pass language happens automatically, but to make sense of it requires, um, requires reasoning of, of some sort and, and conscious, conscious effort. So I, I have a big problem with uh, assuming that understanding uh, is all um, intuitive understanding, that basically is an explicit understanding. If you understand, understand uh, how an engine works, we need to know step by step what are the what are the things that are involved with that. The second part, and maybe here I want to pull rank a bit, is uh, the definition of AGI. To me, AGI is human level intelligence. The goal of hu of, of a AGI is human level intelligence, uh, not necessarily human level ability, but cognitive ability um, and reasoning and thinking. And the reason I can say pull rank on it, because about 14 years ago, uh, Shane Legg, Goetzel, and myself uh, coined the term uh, when we uh, actually put a book together on artificial general intelligence. And, you know, since then, it's actually, the, the term has been taken up in academia and so on. Uh, but I, I think most, most researchers would actually uh, agree with the, origin, with the definition we came up with, that it is human-level cognition as a goal. It doesn't mean to say there aren't useful steps along the way to achieving that, but that is the goal, to say human-level intelligence is irrelevant to AGI. Um, I, I, I have a problem with that. So, so let, let me cover what AGI is a little bit more detail. Uh, I'll, I'm not sure that everybody here is familiar with is, uh, so I'll talk a little All right, I'm coming and going. Um, this is a singularity. Um, there, there are sort of two general definitions floating around with it. The one is... Uh, the point at which we can't predict the future anymore. Uh, and it's, I'm actually surprised how common that, that definition is. I find that pretty useless. The future is already unpredictable. Um, distinction that when we have human-level AI or whatever, that it becomes less predictable. Well, yes, you know, with more complexity. So I, I, I think uh, Werner Vinge, uh, Definition. Okay, is this live? Live, live, yeah. Okay. So Werner Vinge's um, uh, 
uh, definition of the ad advent of human-level AI, uh, because really interesting things happen, and I'll talk about that. That is the definition of singularity, technological singularity, which I, th I think is a good one. Um, and we have, you know, Ray Kurzweil's chart that, that show exponential growth, so you'll see the line, uh, lines on the left that go up, you know, in, in orders of magnitude by tenfold increase, and it, it sort of indicates that we should have enough com computational power uh, around about, you know, now or in the next 20, 30 years, something like that, that, that we'd have enough computational power in a thousand dollar machine to, to mimic what the human brain does. Um, so I, I won't, it, it, I'll come back to that theme a little bit, uh, but let me, let me talk about what AGI is. So artificial general intelligence, and it's a sub-discipline of AI concerned with developing computer-based human-level cognition. That includes, I'll expand on that, learning, reasoning, general problem solving, certainly understanding is, is a key part of that. AGI is a real AI, is, and then what I mean by that, uh, in fact an alternate title for our book was Real AI, but we thought it was a little bit too much in your face, so we chose something more academic sounding, um, artificial general intelligence, is, is what you know, the, the, the man in the street sort of thinks of when they think about AI. It's you know, the, the, the thinking, reasoning, human level type machine. Now, we, we're really interested in the brain part of it, you know, brain in the, in the vat, because we want AGI to solve problems for us, uh, help us solve problems. Uh, in reality, it's more just like a bank of computers, uh, you know, with a nerd inside, some little thing that lives for learning, figuring out things, solving problems. You know, that, that's really what, what we want in AGI. That's where we want to end up. So, uh, contrasting that with, the f I say it's a subfield of, uh, of AI. AI research is now, I don't know, 99% or something, a very high percentage of it is, is narrow AI. And th there's a very important distinction. Uh, AGI is a learning system. Uh, that's basically its main function, that it can learn, learn things. So narrow AI, you would construct, engineer a chess playing machine. You construct a different machine AI that does face recognition, another one that does data mining. Um, with AGI, you start off with a learning machine and it learns to play chess to do face recognition and data mining or, or, and, and a million other things. The, the same way that humans learn things, they increase their, their knowledge. Um, so it's the ability to learn things conceptually uh, and, and use that knowledge. So narrow AI is about uh, having the knowledge, Monica mentioned psych, so people spend you know, tens of man years and tens of millions of dollars hand coding knowledge into a system. It didn't acquire that in any way uh, other than by people actually writing that knowledge in. Uh, it's usually domain specific and fixed uh, rule based or statistical uh, information and it's externally initiated, the, the, the improvements are externally in initiated. By contrast, AGI uh, would focus on being able to acquire knowledge and skills. So n knowledge, the, sort of the more static part, and skills, the ability to do things, uh, including thinking, reasoning, and so on. Think anything that's dynamic would be a skill as opposed to knowledge. Um, ongoing accumulati cumulative general conceptual adaptive learning, so a couple of, couple of terms. I don't have time to go into the implications of, of each of these, these terms. Um, uh, but I think it's an important thing is that it is in fact an agent that can uh, improve and adapt as it goes along. So I think having a system that doesn't have long-term memory, that just has a snapshot of abilities and knowledge, uh, yes, could be worth a trillion dollars for a certain thing, but to me that's not AGI. If it cannot learn and adapt, if it cannot learn from its mistakes, to me that's not, that's not AGI. And it needs to have <coughs> autonomy and experience-based improvements. Um, so that, to me, is a key part of intelligence and AGI. So what are some of the different approaches? And one can slice us up many different ways, and this is just sort of one way of being able to refer to the different mo methods and uh, approaches, and there, there's a great amount of overlap between them. And it's also controversial what bucket you would put something into. But there are clearly systems that are very uh, logical-based, mathematical logic systems, and that focus on, on that or even see that as a silver bullet. Um, then there's the big section of 
what I call big data, and that, that would include statistical, machine learning, deep learning systems, where you basically, um, and, and this would be very much in line with the, the uh, aspects that, some of the aspects that Monica is talking about, where you basically have massive amounts of data, uh, you, you feed the system, or you let the system experience it, and, and it basically acquires its, its knowledge and abilities from that. Um, th the next related, I mean, it can be a subset of that, is um, our neural nets. Um, and here I'm thinking more of the traditional uh, neural network approach. As I say, there's a lot of overlap between them. Um, and then one gets into the camp of brain-inspired, and there obviously is a lot of overlap with neural nets, where the neural network is specifically designed to mimic the way human brains work or human neurons uh, uh, function. And they are, they are, you know people who, who sp spend their careers going down that path. Um, and <coughs> the, the next area that I'd like to uh, sort of highlight separately are cognitive architectures. Uh, our approach tends to fall mainly in, in that, but I'll talk a little bit more about that, where you say, um, what are all the things required to make human-level thinking, reasoning, problem-solving uh, possible? What are, what are the different parts of components and how do they interrelate to each other? What do we need to do? And we build a cognitive architecture, which would then use techniques, various techniques and different cognitive architectures use different techniques. But the focus is on trying to get the whole thing sort of uh, worked out, having an, uh, an overview, a framework um, of, of making this work, rather than having sort of just computronium, as it were, you know, that you just have one algorithm, one silver bullet that if you just have enough of it, it will become intelligent, you know, that you have this sort of emergent um, uh, brilliance. And um, lastly, uh, you know, putting it as, as a separate uh, pie there is uh, natural language uh, focus systems. Um, and, and I'm putting that as a separate thing because there are re a lot of researchers who address AGI from the natural language wing. Obviously, they will then need to decide what technology they use to try and achieve natural language. So, as I said, there are many different ways of carving up this pie, and this is sort of just one of the ways that's reasonably useful to, to us. Um, so, key part is uh, the interdisciplinary and, and integrating, using the right tools for the right job, as, as it were. So, let me move, move on. Um, I can't spend too much time on the technical things. So, an, another way of carving it up is the top-down, bottom-up, and this is very similar to the slide you saw, saw earlier in, in many things, the conscious, subconscious, uh, abstract concept versus percept, so perceiving, um, human level versus animal level, structure or model versus an opaque system. Now, um, I believe an AGI needs to have essentially both approaches now the or, or needs to cover both areas the question is do you start from the top down from you know high level concepts and then kind of work your way down to perception do you start with perception and work your way up do you start somewhere in the middle um, it, it, it's a useful distinction to make. In fact, with the um, deep learning approaches, the big data deep learning approaches being so much in favor right now and getting so much funding, um, these are typically bottom-up type approaches on the right-hand side. But at the recent conference, the AGI conference we, we just had a month or two ago, um, there seemed to be some consensus em emerging that this is all very well building these bottom-up systems and they can do a lot, but they can only do so much. And at some point they'll need something to give, give them the, the reasoning, the high level, the metacognitive ability, uh, the, the sort of emotional control system, um, metacognition basically is an important part, and high-level reasoning and problem-solving. And some, quite a few people are thinking that it will actually require cognitive architecture to, um, to manage the, uh, the, the bottom-up, the deep learning networks. So there are kind of some interesting directions um, there in integrating these two approaches. Um, so getting back to why AGI and human level AI is AI is, is so important or what what the advantages are to to mankind this is kind of moving towards the benefits and risks of it is well AIs are a lot cheaper than humans 
you know, you can teach one uh, human level capable AI um, up to a PhD level research in a certain field and you can copy it a million times. So it's much, much cheaper than training humans to, to, to do that. The second thing is they can communicate much better, they can collaborate much better. If, if one AI discovers something, we can it pretty much instantaneously share that, that information with, um, with others, millions of others potentially, much better than humans can. And also the ego doesn't get in the way of communication, as it does so often with researchers. Can work 24-7, around the clock, uh, which humans don't get close to. Uh, and uh, AGIs don't have certain distractions that humans tend to have. So um, the other advantage is that uh, we, you know, AGIs will have photographic memory, uh, which I wish I had, um, has instantaneous access to pretty much all the information in the world. That'd also be neat to have, uh, and uh, can can turn off uh, some of some of these. Uh, um, cognitive biases that, you know, evolution built into us for, for good reason, but that get in the way when you uh, are certain problem solving and reasoning things, as we can see in politics, you know, our gut reactions to things often get in the way of actually finding good solutions. So they can go into Spock mode very easily uh, and switch that on and off as appropriate. So I, I think these are very powerful benefits that an AGI will have over of a human uh, reasoning, even just at the same level as, as human. Um, a, a few other things I want to uh, talk about and what it is and what it isn't. Um, so r robotics, cyborgs, uploading, global brain, narrow approaches, those are all things that I would uh, regard as not being AGI for reasons that I, I think I've, I've covered. Um, one particular slide, and I'm certainly not going to go into that, is uh, here, but you could you could look it up on our website, is uh, why I think it's extremely unlikely that uh, intelligence augmentation, so basically us improving our wetware, our brains, uh, will not is not likely to happen before AGI. And I'll just point you to the second last bullet point there, which is AGIs don't need FDA approval. So I, I think uh, that that would significantly slow down anything to, um, you know, upgrade our brains uh, significantly. Does anybody know who this uh, lady is? Any takers? Any guesses? Hel Helen Keller, right. Okay, you get the prize. Uh, yes, that's Helen Keller. Uh, everybody knows who that guy is doing his uh, zero G thing, uh, having fun. So why do I put this up here? Um, AGI is about human level cognition, not overall human level ability. So we can have very limited sense acuity and dexterity. We really want a thinking, reasoning, problem solving machine. So just call me Helen Hawking. You know, very limited sense acuity and dexterity. That's fine. You know, we, we can we can do without that. Um, so some of the other things we've we've covered that um, is tool use. You know, if you have limited sense of, uh, uh, sense acuity or dexterity, you can use tools. You could, you know, drive a, a robot, a motorized wheelchair. You know, use tools to help you with your cognition. You know, we use uh, microscopes and and so on. Uh, so the AGI needs to be able to use tools, and that'll extend its power and range. It needs to be goal directed and autonomous. Uh, we've mentioned that. Uh, learning, I don't have time to go into that. This is really just a slide to kind of scare you and say, how many different modes of learning does an AGI need to be able to, to have? Learning, to, to me, is a key thing. Understanding, uh, I don't think I want to spend too much time on this. We'll flog a dead horse here. But um, to me, it, it, it means being able, not just to be able to react appropriately, which could be a subconscious thing, but to to be able to... Uh, you know, if you if you say to a kid, "Did you understand that?" One of the ways of testing it is, "Well, explain it back to me." You know, in in different in different words. Uh, do you see the implications? Uh, do you take context into account? Uh, if somebody asks you uh, uh, ask you a question, depending on what you know about the speaker, about their background, about the context, you may give a very different answer. So it's not just kind of a stimulus response thing. You know, if you hear this question, that's the answer you give. 
You may know, they already know the obvious answer. They may be looking for a much more subtle or specific answer to something. So I think understanding uh, r requires uh, quite a bit more than sub just subconscious um, aspects. So one of the other areas uh, or points that you know is, is worth raising is uh, all this AGI talk here. Is it you know is AGI even possible? And it's it's a little difficult for me to be on the side saying arguing that it isn't possible because I, I believe obviously believe that it is possible. Spent the last twenty years pursuing it. Um, so, but you know, what I, I listen to other people that say, well, AGI is what you're doing is, is not possible, you're wasting your time. And so the question is then, well, why? You know, give me some specific reasons of why you think it's not possible. And one of the most common responses I get is that we don't understand this, that, or the other. You know, we don't understand what intelligence is. So how can we build an intelligence machine if we don't understand what it is? We don't understand creativity. We don't understand the mind. We don't understand consciousness. You know, there are conferences that have a, a, a thousand attendees, you know, uh, every year. Uh, um, and, you know, it's been going on for, I think they just had their 15th anniversary or something. And, you know, they still, every year, people get up on stage and say, we have no idea what consciousness is and we'll probably never know. But anyway, let's come to these conferences and tell each other that we have no idea what it is. Um, so, you know, free will, qualia, the hard problem, and so on. So, to me, people saying is, we have no idea, we don't understand what these things are. Well, I, I just say, well, speak for yourself. You know, some of us do have a good enough understanding of what these things are to, to go ahead and build AGI, you know. Bit controversial, but you know, feel free to challenge me on uh, on on this. Uh, so, how soon? Um, um, the, I guess three ways of looking at it: the hardware, the software, and the theory. You know, so we we may already have enough hardware for it, uh, and I'll just briefly talk talk about that. Um, if you contrast, um, um, you know, if you look at the model of of, of flying. Uh, we've now been flying planes for over 100 years. Uh, we're still nowhere near of reverse engineering a bird. So clearly there are some very much simpler ways of getting up, getting off the ground than trying to re reverse engineer a bird, at least for human engineers. Um, so we, we, we found some kind of a shortcut. We figured out, you know, what are the essentials of, of flight, and we build flying machines. In a similar vein... Um, if we, if we ignore the part of how many neurons there are in the human brain and how much computational power each neuron has, but if we just say, what are we trying to achieve? We want a thinking, learning, reasoning machine. What is necessary to do that? It may be orders of magnitude less computing power that is needed. In fact, Monica said that we already have enough computing power uh, for it. Uh, I tend to be more in the camp of saying it's probably not, we probably already have sufficient hardware to do it, but you know, we won't really know for sure. So there could be a hardware overhang. W you know, once we figure out the software, um, uh, write the software for it, we may suddenly find a, a huge explosion because there'll be plenty of hardware around to actually utilize the, uh, this AI, AGI software that we develop. Um, as, as I mentioned in, in, in the earlier slide, on the other hand, it may take another 20, 30 years before we have enough hardware power to, uh, to, to, to do it. Um, on the software side, the, as far as the tools go, um, you know, software technology, the software tools that we have, you know, often AGI researchers want to invent their own language uh, to make it easier, but I think most of us agree that, yes, while it would be nice to have an AGI-type language, uh, it's not essential. You know, the, the tools that we have there for, for building intelligent systems are actually pretty damn good these days. Um, so then the, the, the third thing, I don't have a point up here for that, uh, is the theory. Do we have the right theory? And I think that is the biggest question mark, you know. Um, yeah, maybe we don't. I mean, it's not obvious that anybody has the right theory because we don't have any, you know, sort of obvious proto-AGIs around. Um, uh, so then how likely is the, the, the hard takeoff? Um, uh, well, actually, let me talk a little bit about how smart the system uh, will will be. Um, so, by definition, um, 
human level intelligence to me is the goal of AGI. So you've, you've achieved AGI when you reach human level intelligence. And from there, uh, the, the number of, of things that can happen to, uh, to, um, to accelerate um, human progress significantly um, for the reasons that I, I mentioned, the benefits of, of uh, that AGIs have over humans, there will be pretty much all the, certainly all the problems that we as humans can solve eventually, you know, in the next hundred, hundreds of years, AGIs will shrink that time span enormously, you know, could be years, months or so to solve these problems because they'll be able to, we'll have millions of PhD level researchers chipping away at, at each of the different problems uh, and that progress will only Im improve. Um, another question we could ask ourselves is, um, is human level intelligence the pinnacle of, of what's possible with intelligence? Um, it seems extremely unlikely, you know, that evolution would just have brought us to the absolute maximum of what any intelligent being can ever be. And I think we only have to do a little bit of introspection to say, well, yeah, I, I think I, I could figure out a way that I could actually be a bit smarter, you know, so, uh, or a lot smarter <laughs> in many ways. So uh, they, they, it seems pretty obvious that human level intelligence is not the limit of what intelligence can can be. So I think they're very good arguments why there would be a very significant uh, change when once we get around roughly around human level intelligence because systems will then be able to help improve their own design plus all of the other reasons that I, I, I mentioned to accelerate things significantly. Now, depending on how opaque the system is, if the system is as opaque as our brains are, then it'll be much more difficult for the AGI to improve itself to the extent that it has the, the, you know, the blueprints, the design specifications or, or you know, a, a model of what the design is, and it can, it's scrutable, it can figure out its own design, um, then it's obviously more likely to be able to improve, improve on its design. But either way, uh, you know, it's, it, it'll be like, like having lots of very smart people improving its algorithms, whatever they are. So I, uh, I'm pretty convinced that there will be a, a firm takeoff, you know, not a foom overnight thing, somebody in his garage building an AGI and next day everything is gray goo, you know. Uh, that, that's extremely unlikely. Uh, and yes, there will be a ramp up to some proto-AGIs that, you know, get developed and that'll be a, a period of quite a quite a few years but once we get to that inflection point of roughly human level general intelligence then things will happen very you know very very quickly constrained by phys you know f physical reality you can you know if you need to build extra hardware even with nano assemblers you can only do that so fast you know there's they they are constant you know uh, the speed of light being one of them <laughs> So when we talk about the risks, uh, risks uh, of, of AI, I think we always need to be careful that we also talk about the benefits. Um, and um, w many of us actually believe we need AGI to save our butts. That uh, civilization, that pe humanity isn't smart enough to manage itself anymore or will become less and less able to do that. Whether that's true or not, you know, we don't really know, but there are some, some you know, pretty discouraging signs in terms of how, how well we are able to manage our affairs in terms of especially politics and uh, environmentalism. Uh, so from that point of view, I think a, a fair argument can be made that we need AGI. We need some, something smarter than humans, something more rational, something more consistent um, to be able to help us figure these things out. Uh, put better political systems, you know, suggest better political systems. Um, but secondly, many of us also want to improve our lives. As transhumanists, we want to live longer, we want to live better, be smarter, and all of that, indefinite lifespans, um, and, you know, health and improved intelligence will require an enormous amount of intelligence to achieve, to, to mess with our bodies and our wetware and so on, and to figure out these problems. These are really, really hard problems. So AGI will definitely help us with that. And then something, the way I phrase it, is abundance with a tiny footprint, so that basically everybody can be 
very wealthy, very well off, have all the things you want, you know, I mean, all within reason, you know. Uh, but according to our current standards, that basically everybody in, in the world, you know, whatever, seven billion, however many people we'll end up uh, with, can, can, can have a very high standard of living, but with a tiny footprint, because manufacturing can be so incredibly efficient, uh, you know, reuse, recycling, uh, you know, ener energy creation, and, and all of those can be orders of magnitude more effective and efficient than they are currently. So we can we can have our cake and can we can eat it. So I think Mar uh, 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 Monica actually uh, in one of the slides she didn't show uh, made a comment something along the lines that AGI is actually a moral imperative. We actually. Uh, owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the world, if that's the way you like to think about it, to help create AGI. That's a good thing. So on the now turning to the, the, the risk side, the, the downside, and we'll, we'll have a panel on that uh, just after lunch. Um, one of the things to remember is, from my perspective, it will happen. AGI will happen. It's, you know, there's no way, unless civilization destroys itself first, it will happen. There's just way too much pressure uh, of companies, institutions, governments, whatever, wanting that kind of intelligence. So people will work at it. It's not something you can you can you can stop, even if you wanted to. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is, then we have these sh shrill voices, you know, uh, from uh, and actually more and more organisations coming on online that are saying. Uh, this is going to end in tears. This is going to end badly. Now, if we take somebody like Mary, uh, I'm a little suspicious when somebody says, the end of the world is near, AGI is going to end in disaster, but if you give us more money and more funding, we'll come up with a friendly AI de design that will save us all. You know, So uh, it's a little bit of conflict of interest. A little bit One should be a little bit suspicious of people like that. Um, and, you know, they're paperclip maximizer argument that even somebody as smart as Nick Bostrom uh, promotes, uh, yeah, doesn't, sm doesn't pass a smell test. So I don't know how smart people like that can actually buy into that. You know, it's, I think it's been debugged solidly. Um, so the shrill voices, yeah, I, I, w I wish they were a little bit more reasonable or rational. One could talk to them, you know, argue with them. They, you know, we, we should be aware of the risks. There are risks. Um, but the question is, be specific. What are actually specific risks that we, we worried about with, with AGI? One of them, in my mind, is that they can be in the wrong hands, you know, or can be specifically programmed with motives that are counter to human flourishing. Uh, in my mind, that is a risk. You know, it's a, AGI can be a tool, and a tool in the wrong hands or used, used badly in a bad way is not a good thing. You know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly very uncomfortable with the thought of uh, government and you know, uh, uh, military having the first AGIs. You know, th uh, you know it's, uh, it does not give me a lot of comfort. You know? um, I don't have talk time to go into this at all, but I have spoken about why I believe AI will inherently... Uh, improve morality, that there's sort of a built-in safety mechanism that more intelligence means more rational decisions and more moral decisions. Uh, controversial, and I don't have time to go into it, but I think there is this sort of this counterbalance in, in AI, even in the hands of the military. Um, so the, the other uh, risk or problem I can think of is it might give us all we want, we meaning sort of transhumanists, you know, that want the benefits of AGI, want the extra intelligence, the longer life, you know, the goodies, um, space travel, whatever AGI can help us with. Um, but is there really a, so a, a solution to all of those millions, billions maybe, that really can't handle that kind of abundance, small footprint or not? Um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And, you know, I think, I think talking about the risks of AGI uh, is, is important. Um, but you know, it, it, there needs to be a reasonable, a reasonable debate. Okay, that's all I have for now. Thanks.
that's the question. <laughs> so anybody have some questions? Come on up here, please. Yeah. Think I wouldn't be giving this? You think I wouldn't be giving this talk if I'd already created it, huh? In my base, in my basement. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I know. Yeah. So uh, there, there's one very, very uh, obvious obstacle, and um, in in my, I'll give a bit of an introduction to one of the debates later on, where where I actually have a slide on that. But the biggest problem is that very few people are working on AGI and funding for it is really, really hard to get. So in my own journey, um, after about five years of sort of scrambling, getting bits and pieces of funding and some of my own money of, you know, with a team of uh, 10 people or so, um, we finally got to a point where we really couldn't raise substantially more money, you know, with just on the prototypes we were building. So we switched gear and took the technology that we had, the sort of early AGI prototype, and turned it into commercial product. You know, similar, very similar to what happened with the original uh, developers of Siri from the Kalo project. Um, you know, they actually wanted to build something, an agent, an intelligent agent, but they got to a point where Apple wrote a check for $200 million, and they said, well, this is very nice. We'll do this for a while and spend our money, you know. Um, so getting funding for AGI research, it's a long-term It's a long -term thing. Uh, it's very hard to convince people that it's actually something you, you can do. Academia, the, the general AI community, uh, is not on board yet with, with that. Um, it, it, a team of implementers. Now, different projects are at different phases. You know, some projects are much more at the research phase. They're still trying to figure out, you know, what do we need to build? What do we need to experiment? What do we need to explore? Um, our project is actually much more at a, a development level now where we, we already have a lot of the things figured out, but we need to actually implement it. You know, we need to collect data, set up tests, we need to do coding, and, you know, you do iterations of it, you code up something, uh, and then you f learn, learn why it doesn't quite work the way you expect it, and then you redo it. You know, so, you know, we're currently a team of, um, you know, about eight people, and we are hiring so anybody interested, we're hiring. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're gearing up. But the, uh, the getting sucked into narrow AI problems is, is the biggest issue. You know, so not getting funding for somebody saying, look, just go the, the long, you know, go for this, the end goal. <coughs> Uh, you sort of always, well, okay, we've got to show some progress now. And uh, actually, there's one other point which is kind of, uh, I think, important enough for me to, to elaborate on, is if, if you go think back about my contrast between narrow AI and AGI, a, an early AGI, so baby AGI, will always be less capable than a narrow AI. So if you have an early AGI and you teach it to play chess, it'll be a very poor chess player because not, its brain isn't going to be that smart at that point. So the problem is it, you build this a proto AGI system, you do a demo on it, and people say, well, we can do that much easier. You know, This has been done already. It's been done much better than what you're doing. So to convince people that, okay, it, it learned it by itself. It's not what it's doing, but how it's doing. So for people to get their minds around that and to actually have come up with something impressive on AGI is hard. You know, and to convince people that you, the theory that you have is actually workable. So, yeah, f funding and not getting sidetracked with commercial short-term projects are, th are the biggest, biggest impediments for us. One more? No? No. Right. Mm hmm That one? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I was just sort of trying to think of, of the, the real question. What is the advantage of, of humans? And, and, you know, I certainly have a couple of answers. It's just sociality of, of a certain kind. But I don't, I guess, I just, it's kind of turning my head. Like, I think there is an aspect of, 
Um, right. It, it, it somewhat is a scary question, and I'm, I can't say that I'm glad you asked it, <laughs> because uh, it, it takes us down the path of saying, are humans going to become obsolete? You know, do we have a competitive advantage in our cognition? And to me, the answer is no, we don't. Ultimately, when we achieve AGI, uh, they will be able to do everything that humans can do, including creativity and so, and they'll be able to do it a lot better. So, you know, do we become obsolete? Um, it's, you know, it, 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 I think it's a subject of another at least two-day conference to, to explore that. Uh, ultimately, we want to build AGI for our benefit so that we can have better lives, but we'd have to reconcile ourselves with the fact that the AGIs will ultimately be able to do things better than us. So what we're looking for, what I'm looking for personally, is a symbiosis that I have this personal assistant that becomes part of me, that I can essentially, through psychological coupling, expand my brain without necessarily having to uh, you know, mess with my wetware. But I, I, I personally can't think of anything that humans ultimately would be better, better from an intelligence point of view. Now, we may still, we may still uh, pay a premium to go to a restaurant and be served by a human, or to have a human performer perform for us, you know, there's still only going to be one Michael Jackson, the real thing, you know, that we'll pay big bucks to see, or whatever, you know, wh whoever it is, and never mind how good the simulation technology and the robotics technology becomes, you know, we will have that, that preference. Um, but cognitively, I'm afraid that, no, we, we're not going to be top of the, top of the pile in, anymore. Okay, um, good question. Now, I don't buy into the utilitarian calculus for morality to start off with. So, right. Um, so I, I actually have a, I have a paper on, uh, on that on my, my website. If you look for rational ethics and just put my name in rational ethics, you'll, you'll, find, you'll find the paper on what I believe morality is and how morality can and should be uh, treated like a science, essentially, so that you can rationally figure out how to improve human life. If, eth if ethics is about improving human life, and that, to me, ultimately what it's there for, um, then we can find out, well, what makes for better human life? And I think there are objective ways of coming up with those definitions. And then you can say, what kind of behavior, what kind of characteristics what kind of vices and virtues can you identify that foster optimal living? In fact, my website is optimal.org. So, uh, so I believe that A, morality is to help you get towards optimal living, and B, that you can reason about that and treat it like a science to figure out what kind of personality profile or virtues and vices you should have. And because rationality is one of the core virtues, uh, not denying reality, you know, seeing things for what they really are and, and, and things li of that nature. That's one of the sort of reasons why an AI will inherently tend to be more moral or make more moral decisions because it's not going to, it's less likely to make stupid decisions, decisions out of ignorance or decisions out of fear, which a lot of our immorality comes from is decisions that we make out of ignorance or fear. Okay, thanks. <laughs>